friends. Welcome to the Living Truth Podcast. This is Kristen Carey hosting today. I'm so excited to be sitting here with my friend, Andrea Rogers. Andrea, thank you so much for being my guest on the Living Truth Podcast today. Thank you for inviting me. I am looking forward to this conversation. You guys, Andrea is a she is a life coach, a professional life coach. She has her own coaching practice called Fully Alive Coaching. We will put your way to contact her in our show notes. She also works as a coach for Daring Ventures. She lives in the Houston area and is a proud single mama of four kids. She has worked her butt off to get through her own betrayal trauma and is a poster child for post-traumatic growth because she exudes joy and uses her experience and her strength and her hope to help coach other women who've been through betrayal trauma. She's also on the board of APSATS. I mean, the list goes on and on. I did not even know Andrea like personally until we were at a conference together just in April of 2022. And we just bonded, like majorly bonded and like hung out together a lot. And it was so awesome to spend that time with you. Yeah. Well, we didn't know each other personally, but we knew each other spiritually. Like our hearts, doesn't betrayal trauma do that? It connects you with the hearts of other women that you don't even know because you know that they've walked through a very painful experience and they've gained compassion and wisdom. And so some of the best people that I meet are people in recovery. So I, I didn't know you, but I knew you. That's a really good way to say it. You guys today, what Andrea and I are going to be talking about is this impending holiday season. Um, this podcast is initially scheduled to release on November 14th. And we are staring down the holidays, which are really, really challenging season, especially when unwanted sexual behavior has erupted in your family and you are reeling from the trauma of sexual betrayal. Now, before we get into this conversation, I want to ask you guys as the listeners, if you're not already registered for my holiday survival strategies after sexual betrayal, I will put the link in the show notes. You can participate in a free private Facebook group where you can get a lot more because there's an opportunity for engagement, but I will share a short video each day and a worksheet that will help you with some strategies to figure out how to navigate the holiday season, which is already crazy and, and chaotic and uber painful when you go through betrayal. Um, the other option is to get this content via email. So even if you don't listen to this until towards the end of that week of November 14th, still sign up. You will get the content via email and it is something that you can use as you as we gear up into the holiday season. So um, Andrea, when you think about this topic um, and you scroll back to your very first holiday season after discovery, which was what year? It was 2014. Okay. How are your, how are you feeling going into that first holiday season post-discovery? Oh my gosh. I was a wreck. I, um, so my kids were very little then, right? My oldest would have been 10 and then my youngest would have been two. And I was the mom who you know, the holidays were just a happy time. We spent Thanksgiving with my family, extended family, Christmas. We had all our traditions, putting up the tree, um, you know, going to look at Christmas lights, watching movies, baking cookies, all of the things. And I was just trying to survive in the day today. So the thought of trying to stir up joy at a time where I felt like I couldn't even catch my breath, felt overwhelming. And yet I'm looking around at the world and people are celebrating and happy. And it just increased that sense of isolation that I felt um, around the sexual betrayal. What month was your first discovery? 
so my discovery was in February. Um, and then we had disclosure in May and disclosure was horrible because we had no therapeutic support. Um, it was just me. I was coaching even then, right? I didn't even know what I was doing, but I was asking all of the questions, got the disclosure, the polygraph. I had nowhere to process it. And so it was still pretty fresh when we started getting into November because I was so raw from the experience. I had you didn't have good help, it sounds like. No, I had no help. Not just no good help. I didn't have help. Oh my gosh. Wow. What do you think was the most painful part of the holidays for you? I mean, yeah, I got a list. Uh, yeah, go ahead. But because everything was so traumatic and so awful, um, my husband at the time ended up getting put on leave of absence from his job. And so we went from being able to take fam family vacations, do things, uh, enjoy life to how are we going to eat? How are we going to survive? Where are we going to get money, right? He, he's yeah. not working. So it puts you into a major financial crisis. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It put us into a financial crisis. Um, there was no connection between us because again, we weren't getting help. Um, and so it was like, and you know, when you, when you're sexually betrayed, it's not like you can just go tell people this right. or talk about it. So the holidays is hard for a lot of people who are grieving because that grief isn't shared. And when your grief isn't shared, that adds to your trauma. But on top of that, you're supposed to put it, put on a happy face. And so between the financial stress and struggle of, can I even buy my kids gifts? There was also this piece of, I don't even have energy. I don't even want to. Honestly, Kristen, I was like, I don't even know if I want to be here, like in life, yeah. in this world. Yeah. And it wasn't that I was suicidal, but I just didn't know with all of this pain that I was carrying, can I keep doing this every day? Can I get up and face this every day? How did you do that during the holidays? Like you get into the holiday season and like, yeah, what did you do to try to cope? I'm yeah. sure that you may have some things that you're not proud of. All of us have ways that we cope that are not healthy and other ways that are healthy that we develop over time. But did you have good self-care and coping strategies going into the season and the betrayal? Yeah. So here's what's interesting about my story is I had done a lot of work before marriage, even during the marriage. Like I was, because I mean, I'm a psychology major. So it's like therapeutic intervention and self-care and all of that stuff. It was a part of my life before I even got into this world. So my support group used to laugh at me because like my first or second group, I came in and I was like, okay, you know, this has devastated us, but we're going to be better on the other side of this. And yes, this hurts, but so it's like, I'd have fists in the air, like, come on girls, rallying the troops and tears streaming down my face. <laughs> so, you know, coming in, it was like, I have this understanding that I am fighting for my life. And I'm not just fighting for my life, I'm fighting for my children's lives. And so I did find a few safe people. I had a few, not many, um, that I could talk to. So it started there. And then I gave myself permission to not fake it. I told my family, I can't, I won't. And so I, even without knowing, I started putting boundaries in place of like, here's where my limits are. Here's what I can and can't do. So honestly, I don't even remember that first Thanksgiving. I have no recollection of it. It's just gone. 
Yeah. Um, but by the time we got to Christmas, I told my kids, hey guys, I know we usually do this and we put, I'm trying to remember it was the first time that I told them they could put up the tree without me. And they did. I was like, here's all the ornaments. Here's all the stuff. You guys do it. And I just gave myself permission not to do it. So I would say to people who are fresh on the heels of discovery that if you start now recognizing your limits and voicing your limits Mm -hmm. this could be the beginning of something that you continue going forward and it's really powerful when you start to use your voice like I was I I just couldn't I couldn't people please I couldn't pretend I was so stripped bare And so I just told the truth. I can't. And I didn't. And did you tell the truth in terms of why you couldn't? Or did you leave that to yourself? Like, was that private information? And all you did was say, I can't. Yeah, it depends. on. It depended on who it was. So again, my kids were really little. Um, So what they knew, and this is a common question I get. What do you tell your kids? What What my children knew was that Daddy broke mommy's heart and it hurt really bad. And so I needed time to heal. That's what they knew. Were you separated? No. Okay. So he was in the house. He was in the house. And did he tell them with you? He did tell them with me. That really helps, doesn't it? It did. If a couple can come up with an explanation together, and especially if he could more be the one to tell the kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it was interesting because my 10 year old started asking more questions. She was very smart. And so it was like, okay, we have to have a separate conversation with her as opposed to the other kids. But they had seen me, like we used to take field trips because I was homeschooling at this time right? So we used to take field trips and I was always coordinating events for them. And so they had seen at the start of the school year that I just couldn't. And I told them, I know you guys are used to me operating this way, but my heart hurts really bad and I can't do it. Wow. That's so honest without being, um, like without being super graphic. Yeah. And I think that honesty with our kids is really important, you guys, because we're so afraid as parents that we're going to ruin our kids, that we're going to like destroy their magical Christmas experience or, or that we're just going to ruin them with our trauma, et cetera. But I think it's really important to remember that kids are very intuitive. Mm -hmm. And if Mm -hmm. we act like nothing's wrong, that's actually in a lot of ways more damaging because it causes them to question their intuition, which we're gaslighting them. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Their intuition says, and their heart and their gut says something's wrong, something's not okay. And so my heart hurts is just, first of all, you're giving them permission to experience pain in this life, which is inevitable. And you're using language that is not oversharing, but telling them enough where their, their intuition is spot on, but they don't need to carry the burden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also setting limits for ourselves and saying no is such a powerful example for our kids so that they grow up feeling permission to acknowledge their limits and to say no. Another thing I think is really important, Andrea, and you didn't say this, but I'm going to guess you you were doing it, is to accept our limitations instead of judging our limitations. Like I think a lot of times when I can't do things, I still struggle with this. When mm-hmm. I when I have to set limits and boundaries, I will I will expect and want to be able to do more than is humanly possible. And then if I have to say no or set boundaries or 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 voice my limits, there are certain circumstances and times where I judge myself for having those limits. Did you do that? Oh, yes, for sure. I mean, I, you know, in my marriage, I thought I was married to my best friend. I thought we... I mean, I just really felt like 
God had given me what I had prayed for. I'd always wanted four kids and I had four kids. I'd always wanted both girls and boys. I had two girls and two boys. I, I hadn't always wanted to homeschool, but when God put it on my heart, I felt like it was so good for our family. So I'm watching my kids grow and thrive. I feel like I'm married to my best friend. I feel like we're leading this wonderful life. We're like leading in the church. You know, we're, we're not, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it felt good. And so it was literally like going to sleep, living one life and then waking up in a nightmare. And when you are so, it would be like if you were in the hospital, right? You wouldn't be like, oh, let me see if I can still host Christmas while you're laying in a hospital hooked up to an IV. And that's how I felt. I was so broken. I just felt like it's not even humanly possible for me to pull this together. And I had always been a quote unquote strong person, but this broke me in a way that I couldn't even pretend anymore. So you're right. That, that want to in your heart is still there. I still wanted to create these memories with my children and be that fun mom that they were used to, <clears throat> excuse me, but that was where I had to get creative in saying, okay, you guys are older now. Let me see you put up the tree. You Amazing. do it. Like <laughs> You can still do it. Let me see you put up the tree. All right, you guys still want to bake cookies? Okay, you find the recipe and we'll roll them all out and you can decorate them and put as much candy. So they felt like, hooray, you know, we get to do all this stuff we haven't done before, but they didn't realize for me, it was just life-saving. Wow. So just kind of fast forwarding, like, I think a lot of us think, okay, I'll just get through the holidays and, and then like, it'll, you know, we'll move forward and, and life will get better. And then maybe by next Christmas, um, things will be so much better, but I know we have listeners who are like, this is not their first rodeo. It's not their first holiday season. And they're already looking down the barrel of, of, you know, the, this, the holidays barreling towards us, they're already looking down at it with dread. And I think that's a very normal experience. So how much better or worse did you feel your second holiday season? Oh, it was worse. <laughs> okay, not to scare our listeners, but yeah. tell me why. Tell me yeah, why the next sure. one was worse. Yeah, I'll expand on that. So by this point, my husband had lost his job yeah. and um, had recently started a new one where he was making like a third of what he made. So. It, w- it went from, are we going to be able to afford this to, we can't afford it. Um, we actually got gifts like donated to us. We were also moving because our house no longer felt safe. So because this per- of the betrayal stuff? Yes, because yeah. of the betrayal stuff. So we're packing up. There are people there working on the house. We don't have money. We're still not in a good place relationally. At this point, we had gotten better counselors, but we still weren't in a good place. And aside from all of the like financial stuff, you don't have your heart shattered and then pick it back up a year later. It just doesn't work that way. And so that's that's why I think it is important to share this so we can normalize for people that there's nothing wrong with you. If two years, three years, four years, the holidays are still hard. I'm eight years in and the holidays are still hard for me. Yeah. And, and not to mention, if you grew up in a family with any trauma, um, and especially revolve, I, I, Feel like a lot of families that have traumatic stuff or dysfunctional family systems, the holidays get make it make trauma worse. Like there's more stuff that happens. And a part of that has to do with all the extended family time and the you know the um not just that we're spending more time with family, but we're spending time with our extended family. Yes. 
all the wounds that get raised and then more drinking and more, yeah. you know, there's just a lot of pressure and expectations, et cetera. All that to say that um, I think the holidays are a really hard time of year for many people, even before they go into betrayal. Yes. And then the betrayal hits and it's not like once that gets quote resolved, all of a sudden the holidays are great again. It takes a long time. And I, I feel like I, every year am tweaking my expectations of myself and my mm-hmm. family. Mm-hmm. There's parts of me that wants it to be as magical as I thought it was when I was a little girl mm-hmm. and realizing like, oh my gosh, I think I really idealized it. But then when I really look back, I'm like, there's a lot of messed up stuff that happened around the holidays that I still mm-hmm. carry into my expectations today. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, so some people may relate to this. We didn't celebrate Christmas growing up at Um, all. No, my parents are Muslim, so we didn't celebrate Christmas. So when I got married and had kids, it was like me reliving something that I didn't get in childhood. Yeah, your face. Oh, yeah, that's how it felt. It was like this dream that I had had here was another way that sexual betrayal had stolen a dream from me. And so it was really important for me to create those memories for my children. I wanted them to remember the holidays as a good time, a happy time, not because of gifts, but because of what it meant to us as a family and the traditions that that I had established with them. And so you're right on either side if you had great Christmases as a kid and now this steals it from you it hurts if you had no Christmases as a kid and now this steals it from you it hurts or if you had horrible Christmases as a kid and this adds to that it still hurts um you know depression naturally goes up around the holidays because of the expectation that you should be happy and you know we don't like to shit on people um that's one of the things we teach partners in recovery don't shit on yourself don't take the expectations of other people and put them on your shoulders Mm. I love that you intuitively already knew that you had these limitations um what do you suggest to both part because we have a lot of people listening to our podcast who are, have been betrayed. And then we have other people listening to our podcast who have the sexual addiction and are uh, approaching this holiday season with their family in total disarray and like in shambles, right? Like maybe separated or divorced. Um, what, what would you say to people who are staring down the possibility of like, not having the time with their kids that they're used to having, or just the, you know, the, the pain and the brokenness of a broken family as they're going into the holidays. Yeah. I mean, my first Thanksgiving without my kids, my first Christmas without my kids. I mean, it's not just the first one. Every Christmas I have without my children is hard. Um, and so I think the the thought is the same, whether your family's together, whether you're separated, whether you're divorced, whether you guys are in the I don't know phase, have a plan. Yeah. Talk about it. Don't just say like, hey, let's wait and see what happens. Um, and I really try to help partners do this, which is why I love that you're doing this Um series before the holidays because people can start planning what what will thanksgiving and christmas look like for us this year giving yourself permission to write a new story for it to be different for it not to be ideal so one of the things that i did i was like i don't even want to be around my family my first thanksgiving without my kids i don't even want to try to continue traditions that we did of sitting around the table and I'm the only one there single with no family. I don't want to do it. So I planned a trip to go. Where'd you go? 
<laughs> I went to Chicago to see Hamilton. Ooh, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, but um, with my kids, like I said, it was like, okay, you know, while we were still trying to work things out in the marriage, it was like, what is it going to look like? I gave myself permission to not cook. If I need to order food, I'm going to do that. If I don't want to be around family, I'm not going to do it. The word no can be so powerful Mm -hmm. around the holidays and learning to use it. Um, I gave myself permission to say, you know, if if all the gifts get sent the day before Christmas, so be it. But I also said, what can I do that's new and good? Mm-hmm. New and good. Not just new and surviving, but new and good. What's Give us some new- ideas. I love, the, I love the concept of that. What can I do that's new and good? Okay. So because money was tight and I didn't know what kind of gifts I was going to have for my kids, I did a scavenger hunt where I hid their gifts and every kid under the tree had a riddle. It was just a note card with a riddle. And they were like, where are the gifts? So they had to open the note card and solve the riddle and figure out where I had hidden their gifts. And the joy in them running around the house and helping each other find, oh, we found yours. Oh, where's yours? Oh, help me find mine. So that was one thing. Um, we had always like gone and looked at lights and, you know, in our pajamas and drinking hot chocolate, but maybe it was more, we had more pajama days than we normally had. And, you know, with kids, they don't need to know the why you say pajama days, snacks, movies, they're like, I'm in, (laughs) right. You don't have to convince them of that. So If you say, you know what, this year at Christmas, we're going to have pajama week instead of pajama day. And each person gets to come up with a theme for our pajamas this week. And you make it fun. Um, I think something else that also is really helpful, which is hard to do. So I want to preface it that like, don't be unrealistic. But is there a way that you could still be a blessing to someone. Um, and I'm again, I'm not talking about anything big, but could it be a card? Could it be a note? Could it be um, even to like the ladies in your recovery group? Um, what I did was I gave everybody Hershey's kisses. And I said, this is what our good moments are gonna be like. And I still use this today. They're going to be short and sweet and small, but we can enjoy them while we have them. So celebrate those little moments that come and the ones that don't know that, you know, as you heal, it will get better, but find little things. And I think that's really valuable because that stays with you. That's something you can do 10 years into recovery. Little it's a really good practice. It's a really good practice. So as our listeners can tell from your, your story, like um, at, at some point your marriage dissolved. Yes. The covenant was broken by the betrayal, but how many holidays did you do in this limbo place of trying to reconcile? Let me see. 2014, yeah. 15, 16, and 17. So four Christmases. That's a lot. And it's so then four. on your fifth, your marriage was over. Yeah, we were separated at that point. Mm-hmm. And so how how did it change? I mean, I know so many of our listeners are going to resonate with that waiting and wondering like is are we aren't we is this marriage going to make it is it not Mm -hmm. and that is obviously something nobody can answer except for that for that couple and most of us it takes a lot of time to figure that out right yeah yeah sure but how did that change things when your marriage was finally over in terms of your holiday experience um it changed it a lot 
in some ways and not in other ways. A lot of the traditions and things were things that I had created. So I could still carry those on with the kids. But we had moved at this point. So like we didn't really have a tree. And because we were separating and I knew we were going to get a divorce and I was going to have to move again, we didn't have a tree, right? It was back to like that first Christmas. How am I going to buy gifts? I don't have money because um, I, I was left with nothing. After staying home for 14 years, uh, my ex decided I don't need to take care of this family anymore. And so we were left with like, how, how will we get food? No child support? no child support um how will we get food how will I buy gifts and so this is where I really want to encourage people to find community yeah in that four years remember in the beginning I said I didn't have a lot of safe people to share with by this time four years later I had a community and one day somebody said, I have something for you. And it was an envelope full of money that people had given um, me to buy gifts for my kids. Um, I knew they were sad too. So one of the things that I had instituted even before the holidays was that we would have what I called a funny every night. And the funny was that I would find a joke, a funny video, a funny movie, something that would infuse laughter into our day. So by the time we got to the holidays, they were used to getting a funny every night. So they're like, where's the funny? So we just laughed. Um, one of the other things I did with the little bit of money I did have, I had always wanted matching Christmas pajamas. And my husband never wanted to participate in that tradition. So I found us uh, all matching Christmas onesies that look like reindeer. So we had the antlers and the, you know, all the little reindeer. And so we took pictures in our matching pajamas. And that was small, but so fun because now, guess what? That's one of our new traditions every year we have matching pajamas, but I was back to what I said in year one. It was like, if I can't cook, I won't cook. I told people, I'm not sure if we're going to hang out with you in the holidays. I, if I feel like it, we will. If I don't, we won't. Um, I just went back to exercising my no and recognizing my limits. And again, we were packing up our house, preparing to move. So it, I know it was, a lot. it was a lot, but for my kids, I think what they remember is the fun stuff, the new stuff, the, that the traditions, um, again, small, but significant for them. So we had a little bitty, like Charlie Brown Christmas tree that somebody gave us, like it was like their spare tree. And we laughed about that tree, but we still decorated it and put it up. We still watched our Christmas movies. We still, you know, laughed and enjoyed each other's company. And I think, you know, having so much grace for yourself, that's the only way that you survive well. Okay, how are you seeing some of these powerful, like, self-care strategies, like, like knowing your limitations, um, using your no, um, voicing how you're feeling without getting so emotionally vulnerable? How do you see your kids kind of absorbing some of your authenticity and your strength and your empowerment in that way in their lives today? Oh man, Kristen, that is a great question because just last week I was in tears watching each one of my children advocate for themselves and something. My daughter's in her first year in college and there was a situation that some friends wanted to do that didn't feel safe for her and she said no. 
so I was shocked by that. Then my 17 year old has a job, but his pay wasn't where he thought he, it should be. And for months he would say, why am I getting paid this? And we'd have conversations. And I'm like, if you don't speak up, if you don't ask for what you need, if you don't let them know your concerns, right, then they can do that. You can't allow it. So he spoke up for himself and got a raise. My 14 year old at school spoke up about something that he didn't feel okay with. And then my 10 year old, I went to parent teacher conference. She's at a new school, her first time in school. We've homeschooled her whole life. And her teacher says to me, she will raise her hand if she doesn't understand. She'll say, I don't understand this. She says, she'll come up to my desk afterwards. Even if I explain it, she'll say, I still don't understand. That is so resilient because she's not ashamed to ask the questions and to ask for what she needs. Yes. Now, mind you, she had a lot of coaching to get there, but because my she's the most quiet and reserved of all of my kids. So for me to hear that from her teacher, I literally cried. I cried because I'm like, thank you, God, that all these things that I learned in this painful process, yeah. that I see them coming and shining forth in my children. That is absolutely extraordinary. Um, Andrea, I want to ask you something that I didn't prep you for ahead of time, but um, would you say a prayer of blessing to close our podcast today? Just a prayer of blessing for all the li listeners, the men and the women who are brokenhearted, wondering how they're going to make it past this one day mm. and go into the holidays. Would you mm. do that? I will be honored to do that. Thank, thank you. you. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. Lord, your word tells us in Psalm 37 that you busy yourself, you concern yourself with the details of our lives. And in Psalm 139, that all the days of our lives are written before we are born. And so though these uh, incidents of sexual betrayal feel like shocking and sudden to us, they are not to you because God, you see and you know everything. So Father, I just ask for each person listening under the sound of my voice that you would be close to them. You tell us that you are close to us when we are brokenhearted and you save us when we're crushed in spirit. And that is what it feels like to walk through sexual betrayal. Lord, I just pray that you would give each person wisdom to not compare to my story or Kristen's story or the person that they heard their story, Lord, but to know that they are on their own journey and that you are leading and guiding them every step of the way. And because you are such a good and faithful shepherd, I pray that you would pray, you would guide and lead each one, that you would provide for every single need, Lord, that there would be no lack that you would give them wisdom for new ideas and new ways to celebrate in spite of the pain. And Lord, I just pray for each person that you will send people around to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to encourage, to comfort, to uplift, to support, to provide, and to just be that safe space in order for them to heal. I pray, God, that you will give them new ideas, that you will expand their hope and the belief in possibilities, and to take whatever little bit that they have to give and multiply it into much. God, help them to remember that some things are impossible for us, but that nothing is impossible for you. So show yourself faithful and be mighty in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it just came to me, Andrea, as you were praying is like our, um, our version of like the holidays is so sanitized and like, I mean, I love Thomas Kincaid painting, so I'm not trying to be deprecating to his work, but like, we want it to look like one of those paintings, like right. perfection. 
And if you go back to the original Thanksgiving and let's go seriously into the original Christmas, I mean, really, do you think it looked like the nativity scenes we have on our mantles? Absolutely not. Absolutely. Childbirth not. in a stable among right. the animals. Right. It was messy. Unwed dirty. teenage mother. Yes. What kind of rumors were flying? Why would this be a good idea? If I were God, that would that does not sound like a good idea to me, right? right. <laughs> okay, thank God I'm not God, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. do we understand? I no, it's a it was a mess. But what God promised them was that He would be with them, mm -hmm. and nothing is impossible with God. Yes. You will, friends, as you go into the holiday and you're asking, why? Why is this happening? Why? Like, you may not get all your answers to the whys, but you can be sure, even if you're in a crisis of faith and you're wondering and questioning God, are you even there? Mm -hmm. You can know that He is there even when you don't feel Him, even when you don't see Him, and that in the messiest of circumstances was the first Christmas. In reality, it was yes. a hot mess. Yes. And yet it was extraordinarily miraculous. Mm -hmm. And I challenge you guys as you listen to look for the miraculous outside the box mm -hmm. and not in a picture perfect painting, mm -hmm. but in the miracles that God wants to do, which are sometimes slow, sometimes messy but extraordinary nonetheless when we keep our eyes open for it. Right, Andrea? I love that you added that because the crisis of faith is so real and so normal. Yeah. And you may be so mad at God for leading you into this place. But what you said is exactly right, Kristen. He's not looking to us to do the keeping. He's keeping us. We are being kept even when we feel like running the other way. Look at all the stories of God going after his people and being faithful to his people, even when they were faithless. So he is big enough to handle the mess, the anger, the fear, the sadness, and everything in between. Yeah. Thank you so much for being with me on the podcast today, Andrea. I know our listeners are going to really benefit. And you guys, if, if this is if this episode or any of the episodes of the Living Truth Podcast have been helpful for you, would you take a minute to go and, and write a review, um, give us a rating? When you do that, you give more people the opportunity to hear these messages of hope and healing. Um, we wish you a joyful, wonderful Christmas, even in the midst of your mess, in the midst of the pain. Um, we are so honored to spend this time with you. Thank you for taking out your time to listen. And until the next episode, I'm holding out hope for you.